We will all have been asked at one stage in our life, at least, and probably we have all asked others, what are you going to be when you grow up? Some of us still have to grow up, I dare say, but uh, you remember that question? I remember what, I, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? And uh, for many at one stage, it may have been that we wanted to be a doctor. Can't think why, but I, many did. <laughs> Accountant or uh, lawyers, or all those things. And uh, if you couldn't do anything well, you're a teacher, aren't you? <laughs> That's uh, what they all said. Or uh, uh, more recently, nowadays, I think it, it's much more, you know, if you ask a child, what do you want to do when you grow up? They'll say, I want to be a celebrity. I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but as, as long as I'm famous, celebrity, that's good enough. And you can be a celebrity by doing just about nothing as well as uh, everything. But there is that sense where, uh, yeah, but that's what I want to be. For a while, it was maybe a soccer player or things like that. But if we were, um, I don't know, again, if you, your children and you ask your child, what do you want to be when you grow up? And if they were to say, I want to be a builder. Son, I think we can uh, go a little bit better than that, can't we? I think we will be, uh, with all due respect to builders, but we would probably be saying, no, we want, that's not really the, uh, the career for you, if it is a career at all. But that is what we'll be looking at tonight. And, and the second one, again, and this might date you if you remember this song, but I, I don't know if you recall it, uh, or what, Pink Floyd's most well-known song. Can we get a little bit of uh, head bashing and whatever, but we don't need no Ed UK shat. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the head was going there. We know. Know what you were like at school. Anyway. But there is that, we don't need no education, we're just another brick in the wall. We don't need no thought control. Hey, teacher, leave that kid alone. We're just another brick in the wall. And uh, it, it, it was seen as being something that is uh, not pleasant and not desirable. And, and yet, in many ways, that is what we are. Just another brick in the wall. We'll consider that a little bit as well. And, and, and many of you may well be familiar with that, that lovely old story about a guy walking along the road and he encounters three people standing at the side of the road working. And he asks the first man, what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying bricks. And he goes to the second man who's working alongside him and saying, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a wall. And then he goes to the third man who's doing the same things as well and he says, well, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. And uh, that is a lovely picture of, I think, of many in the church. What are we doing? What are we building? Because we are called to build. Every one of us here tonight is a builder. And we can be proud of it and delighted in it. In many ways, we are part of the building, but uh, above all, though, but it's the question, what are we building? How do we look at what we're doing? They were all doing the same thing. They were all laying bricks, but they saw it in a, such a different way. And really, surely, what uh, we should be doing is having that same picture as the, uh, the man who said, I'm building a cathedral. That man would probably never have seen the cathedral finished. It would take far longer to complete than in his lifetime. But he had faith. He saw the bigger picture as to where it all was going. And for some of us, that may be the case. I believe that's uh, maybe some of the things that we uh, may help us to have a look at this passage that we're going to look at to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. I hope I got it right. If not, we'll uh, change it. It, uh, Peter says this, So put away all malice, and all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. 
like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we are, whether we want to define it, that we are building a spiritual house or we are being built as a spiritual house. I think the biggest thing that really struck me, and it may show my naivety and immaturity perhaps, but in looking at this was more the sense that it's not so much growing our own individual life and building our own life. But what he's talking about is we are all building the church. Now, that may be very obvious, and, uh, but uh, we can, I think, sometimes miss that fact. It's not simply we're talking about building our own lives. We're building a church bigger than the cathedral, bigger than anything else. This was his message to the, uh, the, all the believers, the elect in exile, all scattered around the place. You are all being built into this church. It's not just a matter, again, of us being on our own. That we can, as long as I'm growing spiritually myself, that's the... No. It's together. And not just this church, but Christ's complete church. I think he defines it in the, uh, in, before we look at how we do do the building or how the building is done. Let's look at how he defines this uh, spiritual house. He defines it in, in four ways, in four collectives. That first one, and these are the ones in verses 9. We're a chosen race. Some, gener uh, some uh, passages, some translations talk about a chosen generation. Well, we're in different generations as I look around the room here tonight. So we'll go for the, we're a chosen race. We're a chosen people. You remember that time uh, when you were at school and uh, they, uh, you were having a pick-up game of sport in the playground and uh, you, you're a captain, you're a captain, and you're left there waiting, 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 hoping to be chosen. And you know, I remember the feeling when you were, oh, I'm in. Let's not go the side where ones, those of us who are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and well, I suppose I'll have to have you, that sort of idea. But we are chosen. And in a way, maybe that's uh, the feeling of relief that we have. <sighs> Someone's picked me. The confidence that it can come bring to us when we uh, have that realization, wow, chose me. Before they chose him, wow. There's a, the, we can have a sense of pride that I'm in this team. All of that can come through, perhaps, from that whole aspect of being chosen. And we are a chosen race from God. There was uh, God's people, his uh, chosen people. But we are all included in that now. He has chosen us. And that is a wonderful recollection for us to maintain. And it's all because, as it says at the end of verse 10, because of God's mercy. 
instead of us thinking, well, I've been chosen because I'm pretty talented, because I'm useful. <laughs> it's out of God's mercy. Before, once you had not received mercy, but now when we're chosen, hmm, now we really understand we have received mercy. So that is part of this collective, that we are a chosen and that's why, you know, no one individual church can talk about being better or whatever. We're, we're all just part of this bigger Christ's church. The second area he speaks about is the royal priesthood. That is what this spiritual house is. Well, royalty nowadays don't seem to get an awful lot of good press. They seem to be seen as uh, wealthy, privileged, um, powerful living in their own little world or whatever. But I will take it that we are, the royalty is very often, it's descended from one generation to the another to the another. And we are descended from the King of Kings, from the house of David, from the royalty. I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, you are in the presence of royalty tonight. Not just because of that, but um, you've heard of Kate Middleton? perhaps some of you, who's uh, married into the royal family. She's a, th a third cousin once removed of mine. In African terms. <laughs> well, sister, isn't it? Wouldn't that be kind of... But my great-grandfather is her great-great-grandfather. So I, I'm expecting a little bit of changed behavior towards <laughs> me now, perhaps. But... <laughs> but... Uh, we sort of have this idea of royalty, but actually this is <laughs> the royalty, the king of kings. This, is, uh, this isn't a laughing matter, this is something extraordinary that we are part of this royal house and this royal priesthood. And again, the priesthood speaks about the, the Levites, where not all the tribes were priests, not all people were priests. But we've been called into that position of, as priests. And we are seen to be royal, for good or evil, whatever it may be, but it is for good. But we're spoken about as a, as a chosen race, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation. Now we can get quite um, passionate about our nationality sometimes. They always used to say there are two, two types of people, Scotsmen and those who wish they were Scotsmen, but... Um, <laughs> In terms of nationalities, I should say make that Zimbabwean, shouldn't I, in, in, uh, if I want to get out alive. But, but sometimes, but actually the, really, the only nation that is important is, uh, and if we understand things about, you know, when you watch sportsmen nowadays, they're all clutching their, the badge on their shirt, proud of the nation. Actually, they're just glad for the, the limelight, I think, and, uh, but uh, I'm not sure how passionate they would be because they'll go and play for another country quite happily if they can do or want to. But there is a sense of, uh, 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 increasingly, a sense of uh, pride in people's countries. And yet, does it matter whether this side of the river or that side, we're a different country, but, we're, but we take a pride. But here there is trying to say, well, we're a holy nation. Our nationality, we should be saying, is Christian when we're asked at the border. <laughs> I don't know whether they would accept that, but, uh, but that, that's our nationality because we are a holy nation. And it is meant to be so clearly defined as being holy. That is the nation that we're part of. We, we draw caricatures of different nationalities in different ways. I won't go into how you define Scotsman, I'm only too aware of that. But we have caricatures of the different nationalities. The caricature for this is a holy nation. A people who are marked out as being so different because they are holy. So a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, but uh, then he also described as a special people, a people for his own possession. And again, uh, uh, yeah, that's extraordinary. A people who are chosen for Christ's own possession. Not as in mine, and I'm going to use it as I want, 
as a selfishly, but it, that sense that we are, we are God's people. And let us fully comprehend exactly that. That we are all, each of us here, with our differences, with our total different experiences and expertise and everything. If we know and love the Lord, then we are his people. And we are chosen. We are select. We are special. And we like to be called special, I think. But it's that, in a way, he, as I see it, Peter is giving us a picture, four different pictures as to what the spiritual house he speaks about there in verse 5. You're being built up like living stones as a spiritual house. He speaks there about a holy priesthood in that verse, which he repeats later as a royal priesthood. That is this, what the spiritual house is. We are meant to be building, developing, growing, it underlines that we are to be living uh, collectively, a community, and not just going through our Christian life, I'm getting through, I'm coming closer to the Lord, I'm loving it, but actually we're doing it together, and we're growing together. And for those that are going ahead, or waiting for those that are maybe struggling. It's not a matter of a race, as long as I get there, as long as I get, I get uh, more of the cookies, spiritual cookies but it's ensuring that others get there as well so he offers those uh, pictures as a way for us to try to understand what it is this spiritual house is but then there are the very briefly we would say there are three essentials of the spiritual house that he saves and the first the most important and the most obvious is there has to be the right foundation and that one foundation is Jesus Christ. Most uh, versions would define, uh, the, describe it in the verses, a cornerstone. That Christ is the cornerstone. The foundation stone, or the stone around which everything else is built. We've got to get the foundations right. You know, we in Zimbabwe we love building. Everyone seems to be building. And... Uh, not all legally or whatever, but we'll, we'll build. We wouldn't understand it. But if it's going to stand, it's got to have that foundation. And uh, it's spoken about there that Christ is the cornerstone, the one that sets up all the angles together, sets uh, the, the strength in the ground. Other passages, other commentators, others look at it as being uh, maybe not a cornerstone, but the keystone in an arch which is that middle one as I understand it forgive me builders experts and architects and engineers but it's that middle one that will just somehow keep it together and, and that would be a, a wonderful description of what Christ is for the church he keeps the church together it's around him that uh, everything else depends others speak about it as uh, being the capstone which uh, uh, and, and again as I understand it that's if you like the the top stone and the pyramid and I guess that picture of the Christ is at the top and it's the one different all the other rocks are different shapes but that is the only one and so in a sense that uniqueness of Christ is again it's a lovely picture for us but I think it's really the main picture here is it's a cornerstone because it speaks about that cornerstone in the ground is either going to be the cornerstone or the stumbling block. And if nothing is built on that stone, then we're, people are going to trip over it. But if things are built on that cornerstone, then people can't step on it. But it all therefore centers around Jesus Christ. And, I, and it's no, uh, I'm sure... When Peter was writing this and he spoke about that, I'm sure it would often come back to him, that incident where, that we read about where he was asked, where the disciples asked, who, who do folks say that I am, says Jesus? Yeah, well, some say a bit lighter, some of this. But who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Spot on, Peter. I will build my church on you. Peter, Petra, Rock, the whole imagery but again Peter it must mean it meant so much to him but he is saying that's the thing 
And it all comes down to how do we see Jesus? I think it was C.S. Lewis was the one who had said that I, you've got to see him in one of three ways. Either he's mad, claiming to all these things. He's bad because he's going out uh, making these outrageous claims. Or he's God. Others have defined it liar, loony, or Lord, or else you can have crook, crank, or Christ. Depends on your, uh, how you like it. But there is a sense of, there's no in-between. Nowadays, people will say, well, he's a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a prophet. People have different perspectives. But there is a sense where actually we either love him or hate him. There is no middle ground. He is either Lord or he's not. Not a matter of, well, I, you know, he's uh, 50%, 80%. Is he or isn't he? There's no sitting on the fence. If you're not for me, he says, you're against me. And, and that, it, again, it comes down to it. He is the stumbling block. People stumble over. They might say, you know, I like religion, I like people, I like to be good to be, it's nice to be kind to people. But who is Jesus Christ? And it's not a matter of knowing it here in the head, but it's in the heart that I'm actually showing it. That I am showing that he is Lord. Because if he's Lord, then I will obey, I will follow him. It speaks there in, the, in verse 8 that they stumble because they disobey the word. That's why he was the stumbling block, a rock of offense. People take offense about Jesus because he hits the mark. He is direct. He is plain as anything. And there is a strength in that. It either stands or falls on Jesus. Is that lovely hymn, old hymn, Church is One Foundation, is Jesus Christ my Lord. He is, we are his new creation. Okay, that's, uh... <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, we won't. But, uh, but it's a terrific, it, but it, it, because that was written by a South African I, I was reading in 1860, when there was a schism in the, in the church in South Africa. And he say, uh, where, and because the, uh, some bishops were saying, actually the Bible was, much of it's made up. And uh, he wrote that powerful hymn that was celebrated in some churches. <laughs> the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. No question. And we need to grasp that, understand that, delight in it, and make it. Who was he? This, we've got to build on the right foundation. If a church is built on the personality of people or on... Uh, events that it is doing it'll crumble and whatever this church and other churches around this town and this uh, country or whatever it may be around the world we're all built on Jesus Christ he is the foundation we need to ensure that so we need to uh, when we are building this building is this of spiritual house is firstly we need the right foundation secondly we need the right function and uh, if you like, I'm, I see that as there's two functions that uh, Peter explains here, emphasizes. The, there are others, I'm sure, but I think he uh, identifies two. And if you look at verse 9, we are all of those things so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into light. We are to proclaim the excellencies or to proclaim the praises. To constantly be saying, what an extraordinary, amazing God we have. This Jesus is extraordinary. He is amazing. We could get into that. that remember that lovely uh, sermon by, was it Dr. Lockbridge or someone about, that's my king. I want to try and get it. But he, he goes through every adjective you could possibly think of. He's indefatigable. He's indefinable. He's incomparable. He's, in, he's invincible. He is anything we can't describe him but we are called to describe him in the best possible ways we are to proclaim his excellencies 
So when they're not just here in a church on a Sunday morning or evening or at any other time in the week, but wherever we are, proclaiming Jesus is excellent. Jesus is deserving of our praises. He is so extraordinary that there is no other like him. And wake up and see you. But we need to be presenting, we need to be painting this picture of who he is so that others can see. We are to proclaim. That is our spiritual house. It's not the role of the pastor or the elders, but it's the role of all of us that we are proclaiming just why Christ is excellent. Just why he is supreme. Why he is extraordinary. So we are to proclaim his excellencies, but equally as a spiritual house, as a priesthood, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices, and we see that in verse 5. We are to offer spiritual sacrifices, not simply physical, and to a certain degree, maybe that was what the, the, the uh, series on spiritual discipline was, in terms of some of those, the, the discipline being the requirements, the sacrifices that we have to make. But it is a sacrifice is us giving of our best, of the first fruits of our best to Christ. Because of who and what he is. Out of gratitude and out of love and out of obedience to him. But we are called as priests. And he underlines that aspect where when Christ on the cross, remember, and the curtain was ripped in two from the top down, making it very clearly saying, so that it wasn't man doing it, it was God saying, you can come in now. We are all priests. We all can come into the Holy of Holies. We can, each one of us, come into the presence of the Holy Living God because of what Christ has done. And we are called to do that. It's not whether you feel like it, but in a sense, as a priest, that is what we are meant to do. And not just speak for the, and offer sacrifices and seek forgiveness for our sins, but for the people. The priests were there on behalf of the people. And maybe we need to be doing more of that for the people out there who don't know, who haven't come to Christ, who are still struggling in the darkness, who are still thinking that that's fine that we need to help them and pray for them and lead them and plead to God for them and offer sacrifices for them. In that way, we will be building a spiritual house that is going to bring glory to God. But the third area, so it's a, the right foundation and the right function that, that we have responsibilities there, and that is to acclaim His Excellencies, to uh, offer sacrifices in a way, and forgive me, but I'm struggling to find another F word that's appropriate. Uh, and it's the right furniture. I don't know, when uh, at one stage we left Zimbabwe and went back to the UK, and one of the ways we thought to get money out was to take all our furniture uh, and uh, take it over there. But we had to sell all the furniture because the, the, it was useless furniture over there. Far too big for the size of houses. It just didn't fit. It was the wrong furniture, and you hardly get any money for it there. People don't want that. They like flat packs or whatever. But we're to make sure we've got the right furniture in our spiritual house. So there's no point in uh, just uh, no point in having a desk in a in a sports gym, or um, or a cash uh, till in our sitting room. But we are called to make sure we have the right things in this house and I, and I look back to the first verses in chapter 2 there where he says put away all these things in a way throw out that rubbish it's useless it's no, it's no good anymore for this spiritual house and he has those five things the malice, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envy, slander it's quite easy throwing those words out isn't it and, uh, but, but actually to think about what each of those actually are implying but there is no place for malice or deceit or hypocrisy or envy or slander. Put away 
if a, the spirit of the church is filled with those things, it's cluttering it up and it is wasteful, it's harmful. If we think of that, the malice, it is only going to lead to harming people instead of healing people. We are called in the spiritual offering sacrifices to be bringing people together. And if there's still malice towards someone else, I hope they get in trouble. I hope this happens to them or I, I wish this on them. How is that healing? How is that bringing us together? How is, you know, our biggest issues very often are with Christians. And we are still thinking a mindset of a non-Christian towards other believers. You see, they know, how can we possibly, when God loves them as he loves us, how can we be showing them malice? How can we be showing them deceit, hiding things, uh, trying to pretend, which leads to hypocrisy? As if, you know, I'm a wonderful Christian, I come to church on Sunday, I'm very polite, I'm very whatever, but then with the, the wife and the kids or the dog or my work people or whatever, the, the other drivers on the road, I'm a totally different person. Where does that fit in? Because we're still part of this whole collective. And folk are looking at us and defining the church based on the, what they see in us. So he does underline, we don't have time to go into the all, but he does underline that to be no malice, no deceit, no hypocrisy, none of that hype, no envy where you're thinking, I don't like their success, I wish I had it, or I wish I had their positions. Or I don't like their popularity. But accepting ourselves as who we are and them as they are. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, they are who they are. And are we going to argue with that grace? So there needs to be slander. There's no place in a priest's job description for malice, envy, deceit, hypocrisy, slander. So we are to grow up as builders Peter says we do need a lot of education in that we do need a lot of thought control we need to be a brick in the wall we need to be the builder of that wall there's that other slightly more modern chorus which maybe is out of date for this church as well but I'm building a people of power I'm building a people of praise who move through this land by my spirit and glorify his special, my precious name. Thank you, sir. God is building a people. But is that what we're seeing? Not just in this church, but his church, his spiritual house. People of power. A people of praise. Proclaiming his excellencies. Offering sacrifice. We are a, spirit, a, a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. But how do we see it? Are we just building, laying bricks? Are we just going through our Christian life? I read my Bible. I come to church. I pray. I fast. I whatever. I'm doing what I'm told to do. Without seeing where it all fits in. Or are we building a wall where we are, I know what this is where it fits in, I've got to do this and I need to, uh, people rely on me for this so I'm playing my part? Or do we see that actually we are part of something incredible? And some of the cathedrals you can see around the world are extraordinary pieces of architecture. How they could have been built when they were built hundreds of years ago with all the... Um, the finery and the, uh, the size and whatever, extraordinary feats. Well, we're building something even bigger. It's Christ who is building. But do we see that we're part of it? I believe Peter is trying to say to us, guys, see, look at this. But it all comes back. Who's Jesus? Is he Lord or not? There's no ifs, buts, subconditions, subparagraphs, different clauses, yea or nay.
He is the stumbling block or he is the cornerstone. I pray that uh, we continue to, uh, to be faithful to him and offer up our spiritual sacrifices as a means of building up his spiritual house. And it be to his glory and to his praise. So we pray. Father God, for your extraordinary grace and mercy which we have received, we are so truly grateful. You have called us to be your people. You've selected us. You've put us on your team. You've called us to a purpose. As part, each one of us, as part of a much bigger scheme. I pray that you will enable us to catch a vision as to just exactly what it is we're building. That it may encourage and excite us even more and inspire us to go further. And to fulfill the responsibilities that you've given to us as modern day priests. To proclaim your excellencies and to offer sacrifice. So uh, we pray that you will help us as we build your church this week and that it be to your glory. Amen.